All right, everybody. Ben Schachter here from Total Brokerage. It's about 1130 on January 20th, 2021. I have the distinct pleasure of being here with my friends from Southern Classic Realtors in Georgia. Thank you to James Hamby for allowing me to present today. I'm going to be walking you through Total Brokerage. This will be the fourth training session that we're having on Total Brokerage. First thing I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to mute all the back noise so it's quiet for everybody. So this way, everyone is muted. If you do find the need to speak, certainly unmute yourself. Uh, James has requested that you hold all of your questions until the end. Uh, James is going to administer the chat log, but I know that's challenging to do from his cell phone, which is what he is on at the moment. So let's give him a chance at least to get to his computer before he's administering the chat log. But as far as your verbal questions go, I'm thrilled to answer them. But there's a lot of you and there's only one of me. So if we kind of hold the questions to the end, I would deeply appreciate that. Uh, I want you all to feel comfortable with total brokerage by the time we're done today. But the only way you're really going to feel comfortable is when you start using it. Because you could watch me over and over again, because we are recording today's training session as we've recorded all of the prior training sessions, you're not going to get totally comfortable with the platform until you start diving in. It's really no different to me than driving a car. You can watch mom and dad drive when you're 16 years old, but until you get behind the wheel, you can't really appreciate what that car is doing until you're in the driver's seat. So I'd like to get you all in that driver's seat as quickly as possible. That being said, let's go ahead and dive into the Total Brokers platform. To do so, everyone needs to have an internet connection. We recommend the best browsers to use being Google Chrome or Apple Safari. While you can use any other web browser, you could use a Microsoft product like Internet Explorer, you could use Mozilla Firefox or any other browser, the product is optimized to work best on Apple Safari and Google Chrome. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you and I'm gonna show you my Chrome version of Total Brokerage. To log into the platform, which I'm already logged in, so actually let me log out so I can show you the login experience. You are going to go to SCR, the abbreviation for your brokerage name, .totalbrokerage.com. SCR.totalbrokerage.com. Uh, and you're going to see the Southern Classic Realtors logo on the top. If you do not see Southern Classic Realtors logo on the top, you're on the wrong page. Let me give you an example. Southern Classic realtors.totalbrokerage.com. Boy, that looks awfully accurate, doesn't it? But it's not accurate because it has the Total Brokerage logo on the top. You will not be able to log in here. If you type in Southern Classic realtors.totalbrokerage.com or anything else, and you see the Total Brokerage logo, you will not be able to log in. So you have to get this right, scr.total brokerage.com, scr.totalbrokerage.com. You'll see the Southern Classic logo and that's got your name all over it. If it's your first time logging in, you don't have a username and password, forgot your password, don't know your password, click here to reset your password if you're a first time user. If you do know your password and email, of course you're gonna do that here. Your email address is whatever email address James has given me that he has on file for you. I know some of you have four, five, six different email addresses. There's no way I will know which email address James assigned to you. I'm sure you all know which email address you communicate with James and how he communicates with you. That's the email address you'll use for login purposes because he provided me the list. So I'm going to go ahead and log in here. And now I'm in the platform. By the way, if it is your first time and you try logging in with that, I forgot my password link at the bottom. That password link that's going to be sent to you is only good for between five and seven minutes. So please make sure you expeditiously check your email to log in and set up your password if you've never done that before. Once you're in Total Brokerage, you'll be landing on our dashboard. Our dashboard is the home screen where you'll spend quite a bit of your time. Now, I'm not going to go through in depth the dashboard because that was covered during the first two trainings, but I want to couple, cover a couple of highlight features for you. First of all, it's important to know that our platform is completely mobile responsive. So you can use all of Total Brokerage on an iPhone, on an Android, on a Windows phone, on an Amazon Kindle, on any type of mobile device, even a tablet. You do not have to go to the app store and download any apps whatsoever because our platform in a mobile responsive architecture responds to whatever type of device you are on. The software can detect the type of hardware you're using and it adjusts itself. Right now, you're all looking at total brokerage on my 15-inch computer monitor. If I was logged in on a 4-inch iPhone or a 4-inch Android, this is what it would look like. This is a simulation of what a 4-inch screen would look like where it's different. The one major difference that you're recognizing is that menu that is here on the left side of the screen, 
does not seem to be readily locatable from the mobile version of the software. But if you notice at the top where it says Southern Classic Realtors, you have these four white bars. There's your menu right there. So you can access the menu on mobile, just look for the four white bars in the top right hand corner and you can click on those and access that information. It's easier to see of course on a full screen view, but you can do it on mobile just the same. This is important because we don't have a watered down version of total brokerage. James has elected to proceed with our largest, most powerful version of total brokerage, which is our enterprise platform. So you have all the features and all the tools that we offer, thanks to having a really forward thinking and generous broker in James. That means that unlike other brokerages that have limited functionality in total brokerage, you have every conceivable tool that we have available to us, as well as seven day a week customer service. When you're on the dashboard, you've got our statistical reporting widgets that we covered last time. This is where you can pull information data out of your total brokerage platform. You've got your calendar, which keeps track of all your scheduled deadlines, appointments, showings, uh, contract deadlines that may be upcoming, and you have your daily to-do list. If you haven't already synchronized your total brokerage calendar with your personal calendar, you want to do that. We do sync up with Google Android Calendar. We sync up with iPhone iCal. We sync up with Microsoft Outlook Calendar. And we sync up with Yahoo Calendar. So no matter what type of digital calendar you're already using, you can take the contents of the total brokerage calendar and have it import directly into your local calendar. You can find all the settings to do that under your name at the top of the page on the top right, and then you click on my profile. When you do so, there are instructions to follow the calendar synchronization. This means that anything that appears on the total brokerage calendar is going to display itself on your local calendar. Nobody wants to have two calendars. That is a pain in the neck hassle. Having one calendar where all your information merged into one place is much more practical. So please make sure that you do set up that calendar synchronization. It's gonna help a lot with our platform as well as help you keep on track. So just look for your name in the top right-hand corner, click on my profile, and then follow the steps found here under the calendar feed link. And the last thing I'll share with you on our desktop after the statistical reporting widgets, after the calendar and after the navigation menu is our daily to-do list. Our daily to-do list is powered through our action plans. Action plans are preset recipe cards that tell you what to do. You have a preset recipe card every morning. You wake up, you shut off your alarm clock, you make your bed, you brush your teeth, you do some exercise, you take a shower, you get dressed, you have breakfast and you leave the house. That is a consistent recipe that you follow every single day. We offer the same functionality in total brokerage. This is your preset recipe cards that reminds you exactly what you're supposed to be doing. I took a listing. I signed the listing agreement. Step one, order professional photos. Step two, enter an MLS. Step three, set up a just listed postcard. Step four, schedule an open house. Step five, schedule a broker's open. Step six, order a yard sign to go out front. Step seven, create listing brochures to put in the property. Step eight, if the property hasn't sold in 60 days, it's time to have a heart to heart with the seller about a price reduction. And those are the same steps you like to follow with every seller you work with. You get to create your own action plans. What type of processes do you follow? Do you want to always order postcards? Do you want to always request price reductions? That's up to you. You make those decisions, not us. But how do you stay on task with all of the different things that you have outlined when you have multiple transactions and things happening in your personal life? You go to the setup tab over here on the left-hand side, the setup tab here on the left side, you click it and you select action plans. And under action plans, you can create your own instructional recipe cards that will be fueled into total brokerage so that every day you get a pop-up here on your daily to-do list of where you are in each transaction. On the Johnson file, I have to order postcards. On the Smith file, I have to order a yard sign. On the Burger file, I have to ask for a price reduction. On the Jameson file, I have to make arrangements for the appraisal to do the appraisal whatever the steps may be. So the to-do list helps you stay on track. So it's a very, very good tool to keep organized. 
That is as far as I want to go today in the dashboard. I've shown you the four main components. Now I want to go into the CRM. Again, if you're on mobile and you want to convert to the CRM, since you can scroll up and down, you'll notice on the top of the page in those four white bars, you can click them and there is the CRM. CRM stands for Customer Relationship Management. This is exceedingly important. The National Association of Realtors tells us that over 93%, you heard me right, over 93% of transactions involving realtors in the US last year, the realtors were introduced to their customer, either because it was a personal relationship that already existed, or it was a warm introduction. That's why you're here all the time. Sphere of influence, sphere of influence, network, network. 93% of transactions happen between customers who you know or customers that were referred to you. That only leaves over 7%. 7% of realtor customer relationships were created out of thin air due to advertising. So tell me something, friends. Why do we obsess like crazy people over having the perfect advertisement, the perfect postcard, the perfect newspaper ad, the perfect bus bench, the perfect airplane sign dragging behind the airplane, the perfect car wrap. Why do we obsess about spending all this money and the right colors and the right hairstyle and the right teeth? Why do we obsess when that's only 7% of the business? 93% of the business is not dependent upon how nice your wording is or how pretty you look. 93% is based upon the relationships you have with people and how referable you are. So let's start focusing on 93% of our income and let's not worry so much on the expensive part of our business, which is the advertising portion. I'm gonna grab a drink real quick. Gotta keep energized for these two hour training sessions, right? Okay, so under CRM, Customer Relationship Management, we're gonna click the first button, this is View Contacts. Under view contacts, this shows me all the contacts I have in the system. It shows me who I have in there at this time, okay? These are my existing contacts. I can search for contacts here in the general search bar. Think of this almost like a Google search. You can type in any keyword, and if the keyword is matching, it'll come up. Now, you can see Garth Brooks's name is Garth Brooks. Mary Poppins lives in Brooks, Indiana. So if you search for Brooks, this is gonna come up too, because you're just searching general terms and she lives in Brooks, Indiana. Bob Hope over here lives on Jones Brook Lane. Jones Brook Lane. If you search for the keyword Brooks, guess what? Bob Hope is gonna come up because you live on Jones Brooks Lane. General search terms go here and the results are matching accordingly. If you wanna specify the last name Brooks, you click on the advanced tab and now you can search just for people who have the last name Brooks, as opposed to living in the city of Brooks or on the street called Brooks. And when you push search with the last name equal Brooks, you have a smaller list of people, only those that have Brooks in their name, as you can see. Okay, so keep that in mind when you go through the platform that you've got two ways to search in the CRM. You can either search under the general terms, which are here, or you can search under the advanced tab, which allows you to isolate specific search terms. And you can fill in multiple fields if you wish. That's viewing contacts, pretty simple, okay? The next option we have is adding a contact, right down here, plus add a contact. To add a contact, you must have a first and last name, and you must have at least one form of communication. So that would either be a single email address or a single phone number. Without a single email address, or a single phone number, you're not going to be able to save the person into this file. So I'm going to add a customer named Dolly Parton in here. I'm going to try to save her. And when I push save, it tells me right here that she has to be with a, con with a contact, okay? So I'm going to add in an email address or a phone number for her. So I'm going to give her dolly.parton at gmail.com, and it will let me automatically save this record now because I've installed an email address for her. So she's updated, okay? That's the minimum you need to be able to save a file. First and last name and one form of contact. You have lots of options on this page. All these tabs are optional to you. The more you fill in, the stronger your relationship. I know that hot buttons for people are always their children, 
and their pets. Now, some people are fishermen, some people like football, some people like shopping, but children and pets are always hot buttons. People feel warm and fuzzy about their children and about their pets. So the more you add into the CRM, the more you know about the person, the warmer and the fuzzier the relationship becomes. The more you'll be able to market to that person, the more you'll be able to build rapport. Karen Reichick is on the call right now. I don't know her at all, but I know she has a cat named Fluffy and she is obsessed with her cat named Fluffy. And she just happened to mention one day that Fluffy was messing up the papers in her office because I saw Fluffy run across the desk on the Zoom meeting. So I made a note in the file, in Karen's file, under the details tab, that she has a pet and her pet's name is Fluffy, right here. Three months later, I'm on a Zoom meeting and I see Karen and I unmute myself and I say, hey, Karen, haven't seen you in three months. How is Fluffy? That is so much more meaningful to Karen than just saying, Karen, I really like your long sleeve brown shirt. It means a lot more to Karen than I ask how Fluffy's doing than Karen, I really like your brown shirt. Because people appreciate when you know more about them. Right, Larry, Larry is a huge Bulldogs fan. I mean, Larry Johnson is like a diehard Bulldogs fan. He hates the Gators, he hates the Volunteers, he hates the Gamecocks, but this guy is all Bulldogs, like a nut job with the Bulldogs. When I say to him, hey, Larry, how do you like the new coach of the Bulldogs? When I see him three months from now, oh man, I'm so excited, I love the Bulldogs, yeah! Right, he's all excited. If I say, hey, Larry, where'd you buy that spiffy blue checkered shirt? I got it at Banana Republic. Why do you care? Lots of people wear spiffy blue checkered shirts. Nothing exciting about my spiffy blue checkered shirt, right? So the key I'm bringing up to you fine folks is if you want to increase your business, building your network, it's not only the quantity of the size of people in your network, it is also the quality of your network. And your quality of your network, the quality of your sphere of influence is based upon how much information you know and how much information you keep track of on your customers. And the more information you know and the more you keep track of, the more likely you are to be able to extract business from them. Okay, so it's very, very important if you're looking to enhance the size and quality of your network that you take advantage of these fields and enter in as much information as you can so you can go back and regurgitate that information on your customers for marketing purposes, okay? So now we're going to show you how to add a contact, just kick plus add a contact, very simple, we talked about that. Now we can show you how to upload all your contacts. Hey, Ben, I already have an iPhone. Hey, Ben, I already have an Android. And I've got 500 phone numbers. I wish there was an easy way to bring those phone numbers and those names into my CRM because I don't want to add each person one at a time. That sounds miserable. So you can import all your contacts in bulk. Just click the import button, click the check mark, and we will allow you to import either customers or vendors. Vendors will be people you do business with. Vendors are not... Vendors are not potential buyers, sellers, landlords, and tenants. Contacts are potential buyers, sellers, landlords, and tenants. Vendors are the people you do business with. Your mortgage companies, your title companies, your insurance companies, your landscape companies, your swimming pool companies that clean out the chlorine in the swimming pool. Those are vendors, people you do business with. So it's important you recognize who you're uploading into your list of customers or contacts in total brokerage. It says right here, you can drag and drop a CSV file or click the upload button. Well, Ben, I'm not all that computer savvy. I have no idea what that means. You can drag and drop a CSV file or click the upload button. So that begs the question, how do I take my contacts from my iPhone? How do I take my contacts from my Android? How do I take my contacts from the MLS? How do I take my contacts from some other product I might be using, like Constant Contact or MailChimp, and how do I turn them into a CSV file so that I can conveniently upload them into Total Brokerage? Pretty simple. You're going to go out on the World Wide Web to YouTube, and you are going to ask YouTube the question. Why are you going to ask YouTube? But you, because you cannot believe all the crazy easy answers that are available free of charge at your fingertips. And the question is, how can I make 
my iPhone contacts turn into a CSV format? Isn't that the question? That's exactly what you want to know because it says in total brokerage, it has to be CSV. And we will show you in seconds, a three minute, an eight minute, a 54 second, a five minute, a four minute video on how to take all the customers you already have as prospects and suck them right out of your iPhone and upload them to total brokerage. Is this going to erase them off your phone? No, this is going to photocopy them from your phone and make a copy available to you so you can use them in total brokerage. I just saved you 20 hours worth of work having to manually type all your contacts into total brokerage. Perhaps you're using some other product like um, Follow Up Boss. Turn Follow Up Boss contacts into CSV. Just ask the question of YouTube and right away, here's a video. Best practices for importing contacts for Follow Up Boss. How to use Follow Up Boss like a boss. And it shows you a video of exactly how to do that. So if you need to turn your existing database, wherever you have your customers, into a CSV format because you want to click the import button and you want to import all your customers, just click import, check the box, and then choose if you're uploading contacts or customers and click upload. It's very simple. Like I said, just save you 20 hours worth of work. View vendors. Vendors, as I shared, are people you do business with. Your favorite mortgage, your favorite title, your favorite landscape, your favorite grass cutting companies, those are your vendors. Why are they treated differently than customer contacts? Because your vendors, you can give access to your transactions. I want the title company to be able to get in here. I want to share documents with the mortgage company. That's what you do with your vendors, different from your customers, okay? I think this is probably a good, quick opportunity to see if there's any questions, James, before you go too far down into transactions, because we're about to jump over to transactions. So I'm gonna give you guys about a minute or two to ask any questions about what I've already discussed specifically. How do you separate vendors if they're on the list? Good question, Larry Johnson. The way you're gonna separate them is you're gonna do that on the CSV sheet, right? When you export all your contacts out of your iPhone and you export 500 names, you have a choice, Larry. You can look at the spreadsheet and you can divide the spreadsheet, which is the CSV file into two. I'm gonna have 375 customers and 125 vendors, two separate spreadsheets. That can be done prior to your upload in total brokerage. That's fine. The other option is just take all 500 and upload all 500 under contacts and put all of them in your customer database because you have tremendous storage capacity. So there's not gonna be a problem there. And then later, as you need individual vendors, you can add them one at a time into your transaction. So whatever you think is simple, either take the 500 names in your iPhone and divide them into two CSV files, one customer, two vendors or say the heck with that, I'm not wasting my time, just import all 500 into customers and then down the road as you need to use a mortgage broker, as you have to use a title company, enter them one at a time into the vendor file because I'm sure your vendor list is going to be much, much, much smaller than your customer contact list. You probably don't have a hundred mortgage and title insurance companies. You probably only have 20 or 30 that you work with at the most. Whereas 99% of your contacts are going to be customers. Hopefully that answers your question. Other questions? You can't tell me that I did that good of a job that nobody has any other questions. I know I'm not that good of a teacher. You gotta have questions. What does Chitara has to say? If a contact is a buyer or a seller, should they be entered twice with different lead types? No, I would not do that, Chitara. I would suggest uploading them only as one. It's not going to stop you from selling a house to a listing customer. It's not going to stop you from listing a home for a buyer. You should just label them with the most likely scenario of what the relationship is that you're going to be engaging with them. What is the next step in your relationship? Are they more likely to buy first or are they more likely to sell first? But it does not matter how you label them. You'll still be able to use them because quite frankly, you might label them a buyer and they may decide the market is too hot right now and they just want to rent and they may become a tenant. So the label does not serve any other purpose other than the most likely situation you use them for. I am not sending my tenants an email about my new $700,000 sale listing. 
because they might be off put or insulted that I'm bragging about a $700,000 sale listing and they're trying to rent a property section eight for uh, $825 a month. So that's what the purpose is to be able to isolate. Okay, thank you for the compliment, Chitara. I appreciate it. Other questions? Okay, 15 more seconds to fire off questions. Otherwise, we're going to move on to transactions. Okay. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. Thank you, sir. Let's go back into share screen and let's go into transactions. So there's two ways to create a transaction in total brokerage. You can start by adding a contact, which you saw me just a moment ago, add this customer by the name of Dolly Parton. And here she is. So once I've added a customer into total brokerage, I can convert this customer lead into a transaction by one of two ways. The first way is it says transactions right here. I can click on transactions and it says no transactions found. Click to create a transaction. Well, that's pretty easy. That's pretty easy. Click on transactions. No transactions found. Click to create a transaction. That's option one. Option two in the CRM is I can go to the actions menu. Under actions, create transaction. They both deliver the exact same result. Makes no difference. So from view contacts, I pick the customer that I want to create a transaction for, and I either go to the transaction menu and I click no transactions found, click, or I go to the actions menu and click create a transaction. Either way, that's the first way you create a transaction, all from the CRM. The other way you can create a transaction is you can actually go down to the transactions menu on the left-hand side right over here, click on transactions and view all your transactions, view all your existing transactions. But I'm not interested in one of the 500 current transactions. I want to create a new one. So once again, actions create a transaction. Either way, you're starting from scratch. But here's a little tip, my friends. If you go to transactions and you go to create transaction, you're gonna to have to enter that information on Dolly Parton again, right? Because it has no idea who you're trying to create a transaction for. So it's perfectly fine if you go to view transactions and you click create a transaction, that's fine. But I have always found it easiest to do it from the CRM by viewing my customers here because I already have a lot of information and data on this customer. So this is my preference, but it is your option. So I'm in Dolly Parton's file, actions, create a transaction. And now I am taken to what's called the wizard. The wizard is a preset series of mandatory questions that you must, must, must answer each time you try to create a new transaction. The reason you must answer these questions is based on your answers, and every single question has a drop down of answers to choose from. The software is going to assemble for you all of the required Georgia Realtors and SCR documents. You must, must, must answer these questions because based on how you answer them, all of your documents are going to be assembled. If you're lazy and you skip over this question, for the buyer, seller, landlord, or tenant, and you're trying to take a listing, I got news for you. You're gonna be really mad that you skip this question because if you say buyer, it's gonna generate a purchase contract. It's not gonna generate a listing agreement. And that is 100% your fault because you left the default answer as buyer. So you told the software, I want a purchase contract. I do not want a listing agreement. If you want a listing agreement, you have to tell the software, I'm working with a seller or I'm working with a landlord. So it generates the listing agreement if that's what you want. Same thing, why would you go out searching for a lead-based paint disclosure? All you have to do is answer the question properly and we're gonna give you the lead-based paint disclosure. Why would you go out hunting around for an HOA disclosure? If you answer this properly, we're going to give you the HOA disclosure. Don't get lazy on these questions. So many agents make the fatal mistake of breezing through these questions, not answering them properly, it takes twice as much time to go back and have to trash all the wrong documents that you've pulled out and go and find all the right documents. Can you trash all the documents you don't want? And can you hunt around and upload the documents you do want? Yes, you can. But why would you do that? 
it makes no sense. When you're following a recipe, you can't just put in as much salt and as much flour and as much sugar as you want. And you certainly can't skip ingredients. Read the recipe carefully, do what it says, and you're gonna be thrilled at the delicious tasting cake that comes out on the other end. So please just make sure you answer these questions properly and do not skip a question just because you want to, because there are automatic default answers if you skip and you may not like the result of what documents are pulled into your file if you skip them, okay? Down on the bottom, there's a compliance checklist. It offers you the different compliance checklists to choose from. It seems pretty obvious I'm working with a buyer that I want the buyer checklist. Why would you want the seller checklist if you're working with a buyer? That doesn't make sense. So make sure these match up. Otherwise, you're working with a buyer and the checklist is gonna say, please upload your listing agreement. Why would I upload a listing agreement? I don't have one. Because you told the software to produce for you the seller checklist. So make sure you answer the questions so you don't frustrate yourself. After you answer all the questions, there's two choices, green button or a blue button. We purposely have separated these buttons and kept them far apart from each other. That's not by accident, that's intentional because we want you to have to make a deliberate informed decision on how to proceed. Do I want to create this new transaction without any forms or do I just want to create the transaction? Create the transaction presumes and assumes that you want all the documents created for you. Why would you ever click the green button? What happens if you have a listing and Century 21 makes an offer on your listing? Century 21 is gonna draft the purchase contract and send it over to you. And if they've done their job properly, it's gonna have all the proper documents and disclosures. You may not need to generate all of the documents and disclosures if you're the listing agent and Century 21 makes an offer on your listing. So you may answer these questions and then you may push create transaction without forms. However, if you need to generate the forms, which is gonna be the majority of the time you need to generate the forms, whether it's a listing package, a tenant package or a buyer package, you're gonna go through the questions and then click the blue button that says create transaction. When you do that, the questions and answers are saved and then these Q and A's go into the forms library that you see over here. And the forms library has thousands of documents and based on how you answered your questions, the forms library will automatically generate the paperwork necessary to produce and run that entire transaction from soup to nuts. It took about 15, 20 seconds because the Q and A's were siphoning through thousands of PDF documents to pick out the proper documents for you, okay? Any questions about that particular process that I just shared with you? Ben, let me interject real quick. I've had one question about what are the two questions in regards to referral. Uh, number one, is it a, uh, something that we're paying out? If you hit yes, then it pulls in that particular broker, broker referral agreement. Number two, if it's an SCR in-house referral, we have created our own in-house referral agreement between two of my agents that will generate that in so the agents can use that. So I know that was asked by Dot and I hope that answers her question. Uh, Bill had a question about uh, entering a pre-existing transaction. We will get into that in just a few minutes when you get into the general tab. I'm good. Perfect. Any other questions? Uh, Sheeran, I load a document, it says status editing. I can't check. Okay, let's, let me hold off Sheeran until I get to transactions, which is next up, okay? I promise to get to it for you. Okay, so now that I've answered all the questions, the software has created a transaction for me. This looks a heck of a lot like the CRM we saw on the prior screen. All these tabs across the top, you need to fill them in as best you possibly can. You want to fill them in because it's going to make your life easier. Total Brokerage is a unique product. Some of you, you, want to, you yeah. sorry? Ben, excuse me, do you, do you want to use the transaction that we did yesterday for me that's got stuff yeah. already in yep. it? I'm, I'm going to go back to it. I'm just going to show, yes, I will be using it. I just want to show them that the tabs are all empty. That's actually why I brought them here. If you leave all these Very tabs good. empty with no information, you're going to have to go through all the transaction documents and you're going to have to type on all the documents. Now, some of you may prefer that and that is okay because you can type on the documents in total brokerage. However, 
if you fill in the actual tabs on the top of the page, is that this one here, Marie Donovan, or is that not, am I not the right one? Uh, put in 1170 each to pull that right up. Type in 1170. Okay. At the search bar, on the front, you just type in 1170 right there and hit enter. Back to the court. There we go. 170. Okay. So the, the point I was making there. is if you fill in all the tabs, which our awesome friend James has done for this sample transaction for us, and everything has been completed, then when you go to your documents, all your documents will be filled in for you, okay? So for example, if I click on the documents tab and I pull up the purchase agreement, all the blanks that were fed by the different tabs are gonna be all completed for me, okay? So you can see that right here. I've got the address, the county, the zip, the tax ID. I've got the customer's name, the purchase price, the closing date. Anything that was entered back on the tabs is going to be entered here from the platform. So you have two ways to enter data to create your documents. You can either type on the documents themselves or you can type on the different tabs. They do backfill one another. If you type on a tab, it's going to auto-populate that field in the documents. If you type in the document, it's gonna backfill the tab. So for example, if I go to the financial over here and I see the purchase price of this property is a quarter of a million dollars, right over here, quarter of a million dollar purchase price. If I go to the document tab and I look at the purchase and sale agreement, I will see that it shows a quarter of a million dollar purchase price as soon as the contract loads up here for me. There we go, purchase price, quarter of a million dollars. I'll make it a little bigger for you guys, so it's easier to see. Purchase price, a quarter of a million. Customer says, no, 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 Ben, I don't wanna offer a quarter of a million, let's offer 300,000. I can go right over here to the contract and I can change that purchase price to 300, one, two, three. I can save my work very, very simply. It's tough when you're manipulating Zoom because the Zoom window covers a lot of my open fields, so just bear with me for a second here, folks. So I change the price, so as you can see, $300,000 is the new purchase price. If I go back into the transaction tabs and I look at the transaction financials over here, I will see that it's updated to $300,000. So the contract documents are connected to all the tabs. The tabs are connected to the contract documents. So you're freely welcome to enter in the data however you see fit, that is up to you. Let's start with the general tab, number one. This is the transaction for 1170 Baxter Court. The customer is Mr. Hamby. He's not necessarily the realtor in this transaction. This is the realtor over here. This is the customer name over here, okay? Leave this as a buyer, because we know it's a buyer. It's an active transaction. You don't want to change the status to closed, even if you close the deal, because if you do so, it's going to lock you out of the file and turn it into view only. I'll repeat that. Please do not, do not change the file to closed because if you do so, it'll lock you out and make the file view only. Leave it as active when it goes pending. They do not have, do not have, ben, they do not have that ability. I shut that down. The only person that can change a transaction to closed is, is Sandy. They can only change to active, pending, or dead. Okay, so not only do I not want you to turn it to closed, guess what? You can't turn it to closed. <laughs> so you can turn it to pending or you can turn it to dead if there's no deal happening, okay? Transaction email address. This is system generated. The software created this. The purpose of the transaction email address is to give you one simple way to send PDF documents right into the transaction. Now that looks like an awfully long email address, but it's actually really simple. We use the same format for every single agent and every single brokerage all across total brokerage. The format we use is realtor first name dot realtor last name dot 2021, which is the year the file was created, dot the customer last name, realtor first dot realtor last dot year dot customer last at scr.totalbrokerage.com. Now that won't be hard for you to remember scr.totalbrokerage because that's the login page. That's how you get into Total Brokerage. It's always the same format. So if the appraiser calls Karen Reichlich and says, hey, Karen, 
I just finished the file doing the appraisal on the Cinderella file. Cinderella is the customer's last name. And Karen says, great. Can you email me over the Cinderella appraisal? The appraiser says, of course, Karen. Where do you want me to send it? Please send it to Karen dot Reichlich dot 2021 dot Cinderella at scr.tobrokerage.com. Why? Because if the appraiser does that, they're actually sending that PDF of that appraisal, that home inspection from the home inspector, that mortgage pre-approval from the lender, that radon or termite report from the radon or termite report company, they're sending it directly into the transaction for you. Karen says, that is too much to remember. It's a lot of work. My email address is karenreichlich at aol.com. Just send it to karenreichlich at aol.com. That's fine. They can send the appraisal to karenreichlich at aol.com and then Karen can forward that to karen.reichlich.2021.cinderella at scrtotalbrokers.com. Either way accomplishes the same end result. There is no wrong way. We've just tried to come up with a convenient way to save you time so you can take advantage of that email address and send your paperwork in whenever it is needed into total brokerage. And that's good from a compliance standpoint, okay? Um, any questions on that for transaction email address? All right, a quick point of reference on the transaction email address. If anybody on planet Earth, if anybody on planet Earth sends you a PDF document attached to this, the appraiser, the home inspector, the attorney, the CPA, if anybody emails you a PDF on this email address, that PDF is gonna go right into the 1170 Baxter Court file, and it's gonna be available for you here in the email tab. The email tab was designed for security reasons so that you can go in and preview that document before you upload it into your transaction. I don't want you accidentally getting spammed or blacklisted or virus infected. So we send all your PDFs to this email box here for the transaction. And then you can take that PDF and put it in the documents tab so you have it. However, if Karen Reichlich sends that email to a Karen Reichlich total brokerage account, that email is going to bypass check uh, email. It's gonna bypass email and it's gonna go directly to the documents tab. Why is it gonna bypass email if Karen sends it to herself and goes directly to documents? How come? Very simple. We don't think that Karen's gonna to try to infect herself with a virus. We don't think Karen is trying to hack herself. We don't think Karen is spamming herself. I can't speak for Larry Johnson. I can't speak for Veranda or Becky. They might be sending all kinds of garbage to Karen, but Karen's not gonna send garbage to herself. So again, if anybody on planet earth tries to send that appraisal, that home inspection, that title order to Karen, and they use the email address itself, it's going to go into the email box here, and then you can transfer it to documents. If Karen emails herself, it's gonna go immediately into documents because it does not have to be held for further analysis, okay? Next comment, the notes box. In the notes box, you have an unlimited text field here. You can type as much as you want. There is no limitation. And that is important because you can put all kinds of cover letters and notes in here. Down below, you see that I've inserted some hyperlinks. You've got some tax collectors, you've got Zillow. I put the full hyperlink. The full hyperlink includes HTTP colon slash slash. Once you drop a hyperlink into this box here, it saves it as a retrievable link so that you can go back to it anytime in the future. I bring that up because you're gonna have tax rolls, you're gonna have deeds, you're gonna have information from the utility company. If you drop those online websites into the notes box and you push enter, you're gonna be able to retrieve those websites easily from the cover page as pre-existing links available in the platform to you to help you stay organized. So for example, if I wanted to look up the realtor.com page on this particular property, I can navigate in my browser, realtor.com, I could find the property, grab this website right over here, then go back to Total Brokerage and drop it in here. Now I have a third link available to me in Total Brokerage. Make sure you save your work down here on the bottom right. It's important to always save. Please save early and save often. 
Uh, about 40% of our pages are already set up for auto save functionality. There's about 50, 60% of our pages that are not set to auto save. We're working on auto saving everything. So please make sure if there are save buttons, you use them for manual hard save so that you don't wait for something to be delivered to you that might've been lost accidentally. Any questions at all about the general tab page? Then, okay, James, we okay? Yep, you did really well on that again. Oh, one more comment real quick. Just at the name, when he originally set that up, it comes in and says a transaction name for so-and-so, like it, like it has up there at the top of the right. I do want our agents to change that tab to show the address of the property in the, in the client's name, like I've done here. So it starts off, it looks like transaction for James Hamby, but all they have to do is go in there and type on that, type the address in the client's name whether they're buyer or seller and that helps not only them find out where that transaction is so you might be doing three or four transactions for james hamby but it also helps the staff be able to locate that transaction quicker when there might be a question or we're trying to um, close out a file okay absolutely right so this is where you want to enter in the full address of the property so it's going to make it more navigable to find that transaction if you look for it okay the next tab is the documents tab. There are four different ways to bring documents into total brokerage. Believe it or not, you've already learned two of them. The first way, in my opinion, the best way to bring documents in is using the transaction wizard. Those were the seven questions I said you had to create and you had to answer with the drop down menu. When you use those seven questions, the software learns what paperwork is needed based on a lot of setup time with James and the software is going to present you with those contracts to utilize. You've got disclosures, you've got addendums, you have purchase, lease, listing agreements, what have you. By using the wizard, the software intelligently selects the right documents for you so you know your compliance is an offer, is an order, excuse me. The second way is under the general tab, you have the transaction specific email address. We talked a lot about this. The email address that is designed for you to send anything you want into this transaction. So if you want to send something off to me later today when you're uh, you know, doing a demo transaction, go ahead, enter the transaction email address in your outbound email, and it'll send a document directly in for you to utilize. Those are the first two ways, back to the documents tab. The third way to bring documents in is that handy action menu on the top right, actions plus add a form. Add a form allows you to go into the total brokerage forms library and bring out any documents that are already existing in the cloud that you want to utilize. So if I want to find a commission disbursement authorization, I can look for the SCR Commission One Agent Disbursement. I click it. I'm also looking for a binding agreement date notification. So I can click that. So I've got those two documents already mapped and programmed in Total Brokerage. I want to bring those into my James Hamby Strath uh, Strathern, Georgia transaction. I just flag them and I go down to the import button, which is down here at the bottom of the page, and I click add. When I do so, this now brings those two documents into my transaction for this file. Now, one of you asked a question about the edit status. The edit status is here. Some documents are editable, which will include strikeouts and crossouts. X out boxes if you're taking a whole paragraph or a large sentence, and then of course e-signature tools as available. The fourth way to bring documents in after the wizard, after the um, after the email address, and after the actions menu over here, plus out of form. The fourth way is next in line: upload a PDF. This takes you to the desktop of your computer, and you can upload whatever you wish to the desktop of your computer. So that's the fourth way to bring documents in. If you don't have paperwork in total brokerage, you're completely complacent. You're putting up a fight unnecessarily because we're here to help you. We want to make it easy for you. We're patient with you. Let us help you. Excuse me for one second. I'm going to sneeze, guys. Pardon me just one second. Sorry about that. I beg your pardon. 
So we've got four ways to bring the documents up. We will help you every step of the way, either by using the wizard, using the email address found here on the general tab, which I've shown you a bunch of times now, or the actions menu, add a form, taking you to the Total Brokerage Cloud Forms Library with all of James's documents he's uploaded, and then upload a PDF, brings in documents directly from your desktop. I'll tell you it's a waste of time. I don't want you doing it. Don't get an email in your inbox at home from the appraiser, from the title company, from the mortgage company. Don't get an email and then download the PDF to your local computer and then upload it into Total Brokerage. That is a complete waste of time. If it's already in your email and you have it, no matter where it is in your email, go ahead and just forward it to the transaction email address and we will then have the document loaded right into your transaction for you. Much more efficient in downloading than the upload. Okay. Any questions about that whole process of uploading, downloading, and bringing documents in? Nope, I think we're good. Okay, then we'll move on. Let's show you how to send a document out for signature and then how to make changes. Okay. First of all, before you send a document for signature, you want to make sure that that document is as is as complete as possible. You don't want to send out incomplete documents going to get you in trouble. So I'm going to open the purchase contract over here. Okay. In the purchase contract, I'm going to presume that all the fields have been filled in. Okay. Here is my eight page purchase contract. Anything that's not filled in, I can type in on my own. Right now, all the boxes on the page appear to be either blue or gray, depending upon your eyesight, the color may vary. The boxes are empty. Some of them tell you the county, the zip, the tax ID, what is gonna go in these boxes, but it doesn't actually give you the information on this transaction. How do you see the data that's filled in and auto-populated? You use your eyeball eyeball. We use our eyeballs to see things. If I click the eyeball, it allows me to preview the completed document that shows me all the fields added in and dated accordingly. So use your eyes to see different things and you go back and forth between the eyeball or no eyeball. James, is there a question? No, sir. I don't think so. Um, I think we're good. Okay, perfect. Now, before I send this out for signature, let's just say hypothetically, um, I wanted to add something to this contract. This form has been pre-mapped, so I can see where all the boxes are. I can go in, I can double click, I can double click, I can double click, I can double click, double click for a box, I can see all that. But I wanna add something, okay? Right over here, I wanna see the address of the property. I can right click, add a text box, and I can position it wherever I want it to be. Let me show you that again. I can right click, I can add a text box and I can position it wherever I want it to be. The other way that I can move an item onto the page is I can go to the add button up here, add checkbox, and it drops it at the top center of the page because it doesn't know where I want this item to be. So I'll show you again the difference, add, a text box drops it at the top center of the page over here. Different from under here, right click, add a text box and drops it exactly where I want it to be. So you can use either add feature. They both avail you to do the same thing. It's just a matter of whether you want to drop in one place or the other. If I'm not happy with a location, I just take my mouse and hover over the item. The form we cross appears and I can move it wherever it is that I want in the transaction. So grab it with a four-way cross, click and drag, or if it all looks good, I just want to make it bigger, I can take the mouse and I can make this item bigger or smaller. Okay, that's available to me. I don't need these items right now, so I'm going to toss this one out, click it, then click the trash can. Now I still have, whoops, sorry about that. I still have this one to deal with. Top center of the item is the four-way cross. So I put the four-way cross right here. I take my mouse to the right side and make it as big or as small as I want. Very easy to manipulate it once you get comfortable with it. 
The big button on the top here before we cross allows you to click, hold, and relocate. And the small button on the bottom right allows you to make it bigger and smaller. So what I want here is I want the property address. Right now, it's an empty box. How do I tell the software to put the property address in that location? I simply click the box. I do assign because I'm telling it what I want assigned to that field. And I click property, full code, full address, one line. Full address, one line, as opposed to a postage stamp where it has the person's name, the street number, the apartment number, and then the house. Single line address. That's it, it's that simple. Do I need that much space? No, I can make it smaller. Just click it and then go ahead and make it smaller. No problem at all. Very, very easy to do, okay? Let's do the same thing with a signature box. If I want the customer to sign over here, right click, add in a signature box. Top of the item, I can move it wherever I want it to be. Bottom of the item, I can move it accordingly. And now I want to assign this assign to buyer one. Now it's going to ask the buyer one to sign that box. So you've got lots of flexibility with these documents that are set to pre-map to either use the existing mapping fields or you can add your own. If you decide you want the customer to sign there, just click it and click the trash can and it goes away. Questions about adding features. Let's, um, let's talk real quick about the reason you would do that. If you upload a DA that you prepared, I know Ben, you call it a CAD there in Florida. Yeah. We call it a DA. Yep. Yes, we call it DA, disbursement authorization. If you upload one that you prepared instead of using the system and you send that to Sandy to sign and you've not assigned, added a signature line on that and assigned that to Sandy, when you try to send that to Sandy through request signatures that Ben will show you in just a moment, it will not go because you have not assigned a signature to that document. So my recommendation is always to use the DA that's in the system, fill out the financial tab, that'll auto populate into the DA. It'll automatically be able to fix that to where you can send it to Sandy to sign. If you try to recreate the system, you've got to make sure you add a signature for her to sign. I'm, I'm gonna give you an even better example in my opinion, James. If Remax or Coldwell Banker or Keller Williams makes an offer on your listing, and they hand you, or they fax you, or they email you a purchase contract from Remax, Global Banker, or Keller Williams, how are you gonna get your seller to sign that contract? You're gonna have to upload it to Total Brokerage by either emailing the documents in or uploading them from your desktop, and then you're gonna have to drop signature and initial boxes in every spot that you want your seller to sign. Because when they send it to you, or hand it to you, or fax it to you, it's not gonna have anything on it, okay? So make I have sure a question. you add features when you add things by either clicking add a text box and it drops it here and you manipulate the location or you right click and you click add an initial box. Make sure if these boxes do not identify what's going in them, you must identify it. Right here, I want to assign the property zip code. I want the property zip code to appear in that box. Right here, I want to assign the seller to initial. You've got to tell the box what's to go in that box because the software won't know what you want there. Any questions about that? Yes, I have yes, a question. Yes, um, if you filled out the people in the people tab uh, that are involved, i.e. the myself, the, the listing agent, the buyer's agent, and I have a referring agent, I did that. Uh, she's the, the referring agent is the additional agent or uh, in the people tab. Should this drop down a sign button, no matter what document we're working on, have the referring agent or some sort of additional agent? Because it doesn't. It only has buyer seller. Uh, well, mine has. Uh, cooperating agent, selling agent, buyer's agent. It gets a little confusing. So if you have a referring agent, you should have added her under the vendor portion of the people tab. Did you add her as a vendor? Uh, in the people tab. What, what title did you give her in the people tab? Well, she's just additional agent as 
I mean, no, she can't be. A, is the additional agent somebody that works at SCR? Yes. Okay, then you can have her sign as an additional agent on this transaction. Okay, but how does why doesn't that show up in my drop down? Um, and she's labeled as additional agent on the document itself. On the people, I'm sorry. Okay. On the so, so if she's going to be signing, you've got to add her as well under the vendor tab because only vendors and customers can sign. So if she's going to be signing documents as well, no. add her as a vendor and add her as an agent under vendor tab, then she'll be able to be one of your authorized signers for the transaction. Okay, well, no, it's not that she needs to be signed. I'm actually having problems trying to fill out the, uh, the uh, DA. It, Same thing, still add her as a vendor. A vendor. Add her as under the vendor section and give her the title of either cooperating agent or co-agent or second agent, and then you'll be able to sign her accordingly. Okay, so she does not need to be listed up under as additional agent. I should remove her there and put her in as a vendor position? It depends on the nature of the relationship. And I will get to the people tab. I don't want to jump ahead, but real short and sweet. If you add another SCR agent as an additional agent, uh -huh. that means that agent can log into your total brokerage account and see everything in that file. If your intention is to give that SCR agent access to see every single thing in that file, then yes, that is the security door that you're opening by adding the person as an additional agent. If you just wanna give that person a referral fee and say, stay out of my business, I'm gonna pay you, then you add them as a vendor so you can add them as a referral source and pay them accordingly. Okay. A digital agent simply gives the person key access to check up on your business. Okay. That, that helps a lot and I will uh, work with that and see if it doesn't pop her up, but I have to assign her as either cooperating agent or something else. Hey, Dot, yeah. this yes. is Sandy. Can you call me with this specific question when we get done? Sure, sure, sure. Because yeah. I, I pulled up your transaction and it looks like you've got her in the right place. We'll just walk through your specific questions. Okay, thanks, Sandy. Uh-huh, you're welcome. Okay. So now we've got this whole beautiful document that we want to send out for signatures. Let's just assume that it's all been filled in. You've read it over. You're happy with all eight pages. It is very simple to send this out for signatures. Just make sure you save your work first because we made some changes here, okay? There's two ways to send the document out. When you're in the document itself, if you're ready to go, actions, request signature. There you go. You're good to go. The other option is you can return to the transaction you can be in the documents tab because you got a whole bunch of documents and disclosures you want to send this customer. Same thing, actions, request signatures, either way. So you can be in the document and you can request signatures or you can be in the documents tab with your whole library of paperwork, actions, request signatures. Now, when you get to the signature request page, the first thing you have to do is decide who are you asking to sign? The other realtor, the buyer, the seller, the landlord, the tenant, I want to send this document off to the seller, John Johnson. It already knows John's email address because he's already loaded in my people tab. I have a choice with total brokerage. I can either email John Johnson or because James has given you the advanced version of total brokerage, I can text the contract. Oh my God, this is so cool in total brokerage. You can send text messages for e-signature. How many times have your customers said, oh, it's in my spam. Oh, I never checked my email. Oh, I missed it. Oh, I get so much junk mail. In our software, you can text them documents or you can email them documents to sign, okay? So you determine how you want to send it. The third option under send email, send text is sign on this device. What would be an example of sign on this device? An example is, I'm having coffee with my customer in Starbucks and my customer left his cell phone in the car or his battery is dead and I want to sign on this device, which means I am physically handing my four inch iPhone to my customer so that he can sign all his paperwork on my cell phone. He doesn't have his phone. He's not in a Wi-Fi area. He's an international customer, doesn't get a signal. Whatever the excuse is, I am handing him my phone and he is choosing to sign on this device that I am creating the documents on. Realtor friends, 
beware. Realtor friends, beware. There's a very important feature right here. Require wet ink signing. What does that mean? Wet ink signing is digital wet ink. That's not pen and paper. That's digital wet ink. If you click this box, your e-signing customer must use their fingertip or a stylus to sign on a touch device. iPhone, Android, iPad, Amazon Kindle, a Fire tablet. They must use their finger or a stylus to sign manually digital wet ink. If you do not check this box, they have a choice where they can use their finger or a stylus, or alternatively, they can woodpecker peck out their signature on a keyboard. I will tell you right now, my friends, even though the US federal government says that a typed signature is a legal enforceable signature, even though Total Brokerage will produce for you e-signature authenticity reports, it is very, 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 very bad business. It is very, 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 very bad business to hand your customer your laptop, your iPhone, your tablet, and allow them to type on your keyboard their signature. Because how can we prove that you didn't forge their signature? If you hand them your phone, your tablet, your laptop, and allow them to peck, peck, peck on the keyboard, it's gonna look a lot like a forgery because the tablet, the laptop, the phone is in your possession, you own it and the customer's with you. And we're not videotaping that person with their fingers on your keyboard. So it can be misconstrued as a forgery. Do not please, do not please allow your customers to peck, 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 peck on your phone, your keyboard, your tablet. Force them to use their fingertip or a stylus for safety and security reasons. Any questions on that? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move on from that point. So I can give John the ability to sign in this device. I can email it to him. I can text it to him, whatever I wanna do. And I have a choice with the documents. I can change the order of the documents if I wanna change the order. I can send him all the documents or I can send him some of the documents, that's up to me. Once I am satisfied, I can go ahead and push sign on this device if I want to. If I am sending this to him electronically by email or text, it gives me an option to send a cover letter. Here are the docs we discussed. Please review and sign. Thanks, Ben. So it's up to you how you want to transmit those. And then your customer is going to experience that. Now, if I email these to John, you're not going to be able to see that, guys, right? Because it's going to go to John's email. So for training purposes, I'm going to click sign on this device so you can experience what the customer is going to experience. I'm going to push sign on this device. The documents are now being compressed. E-signature stamps are now being placed on every page and it's preparing the documents for digital signing. Review and sign, not download as a PDF. If I want to download as a PDF, that's just to save it to my computer. I want to review and sign the document. And now I can go page by page by page and I can see every page of my purchase contract and everywhere that I'm legally obligated to sign or initial, I can do that. Now, not only does this work like a charm on a 17 inch monitor, it works like a charm on a four inch iPhone, just the same. So you can literally be productive and produce your documents in the field without any pinching and zooming and you can have it all done. Now, your customer can go field by field and sign each line, initial each line, or if they wanna speed up the process, they can bypass the 17 text message email spaces they have to sign and they can click sign all pages, initial all pages, very simply. And they can either do it manually with their finger and a stylus, or they can sign Jonathan Steven Johnson, likes that font and he can sign like this. So it's either typed or initialed, typed or initialed, typed or in script, however you want. Now you'll notice we have a wet ink signature, which means if you move your finger naturally, very slowly, it's gonna create a very thick black line, almost like a Sharpie marker, very slow and deliberate. If you move your mouse fast, it's a very fine line, like a calligraphy pen. So it's a very authentic signing experience when you're using our e-signing tool, unlike a lot of other products that don't work quite as efficiently as ours. 
Any questions about what I've shown you thus far? Ben. Yeah. Sir. Uh, Ken Mills. Uh, I tried one the other day, uh, sent it to a test client. And when I went through this to do the signing process, you don't, it doesn't step you through every place where the client's supposed to sign. Is that correct? You have to scroll down. You have to scroll down, but if you read the cover letter that I flew past where it said, Dear John, please review the docs, it says in the cover letter, please either review each page and click the yellow box to sign an initial, or on the upper right hand corner, please click the sign all pages now, and you only have to sign once. It said that in the cover letter. Okay, but it, it doesn't step the client through and go to each place they're supposed to sign, right? It does not. They have to scroll down, but the good news is there is no skip. There is no, I don't want to sign this page. There is no pass by this one. They either sign it all or they sign nothing. There's no halfway in between. Okay, so, so if they're they not going to get back apart. They, they can't miss it. If they miss it, they miss every page because there's okay. no way to return it to you because when they push submit on the last page, it'll say, warning, you've missed four initials. Okay, all right, that was my question. So if they're scrolling through and they happen to miss one, they scroll too fast and they miss a page, when they click finish, it's going to tell them that they've missed something. It'll not only will it tell them they missed it, which is correct, it'll also say this document will not be returned until it is signed in every spot necessary. Okay. All right. So they, they, other... can't, they can't even accidentally return it to you partially signed. Okay, good. One other quick question then. I tried sending in Georgia, we have a seller's disclosure statement that the client fills out. The only way that I could see to send that to them you had to send it with a request for signature. Is that correct? That is correct. However, if that document was properly set up by my office, and if it wasn't, I know James well enough, he would have jumped on us already. That has open fields that are mandatory fields for the customer to enter in their information. They still have to sign the last page, but they have to tab through all 50 blank spaces and type in whatever information you're asking of them in that disclosure. Okay, but when I did it, you have to complete that whole document and sign it for it to go back, come back to us, the agent. What if they're in the process of filling it out and they have to stop? I didn't see that there was any way for them to save what they had done they and cannot. go back in. They cannot, they just can't close. They leave it open on their computer until they're done. They can't save they, it part way through. See, a lot of times we like to send it to them for the, to fill it out, but I'd like to review it to make sure they've done it properly. Otherwise they, they have to complete it, sign it, send it back to me. And I find out they've messed up a bunch of stuff. If that's so the that, case, then they got to go back and do it again, right? They don't have to do it again. I'm going to show you in the next step how to modify a document that's already been signed, which is exactly what you're asking. Yes. Okay. okay. Let's do that now. Is it, are you done with your questions or is there anything else? Yeah. Does, that, does that satisfy your question, sir? Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll show you next how to modify a partially signed or a partially completed document that has errors on it. James? Ben, one more point real quick. When you, if you're sending that same document to a husband and wife and you send it out to the husband first, you've got to go back and resend it out to the wife. Explain to me why Total Brokers does that versus other companies that may say, we'll send them all out to everybody at one time. Tell me, Tell, tell the group why that's the case with, with total brokerage. Okay, um, so why do husband and wife have to sign the same purchase contract, but you cannot send them both at the exact same time? Because, because we offer sign in person, sign by text, sign by email, in our platform, you may send the wife an email, but the husband a text message to sign the documents. The wife might be looking at you right now in person at Starbucks at the property. She may want to make an offer and she may do sign on this device, but you have to send the husband the documents to sign as well. So in our platform, if you've got a husband and wife scenario or three children that inherited the property, what have you, you can send them all out immediately back to back to back, but you have to make an informed decision on the delivery method for each of the recipients. The husband is gonna sign in person, the wife is gonna sign by text, and the stepson is gonna sign by email. Or the husband and wife are both gonna sign by email and the stepson is gonna sign in person. So you can't send all three signature requests out for the same party, all three buyers, all three sellers at the exact same second, but you can send them all back 
back to back to back. You do not have to wait for the husband to sign before the wife signs. You do not have to wait for the kids to sign before the mom signs. You can send them all about immediately. We just give you three different transmission methods of how you're going to deliver to the parties. Is that what you're looking for, James? That's absolutely perfect. Thank you, sir. Okay, you got it. All right, so now we have this signed uh, purchase contract over here. Uh, and we got a problem with it, right? This is no different than seller filling out the seller's disclosure wrong with a mistake. Purchase and sale agreement, okay? Documents that are editable are here. These are all documents you can mark up. There's no signature. Documents that are here have some signatures, but they're missing others. And these are completely signed documents. You cannot mess around with partially signed documents. Could you imagine if the husband signed one version of the documents and the wife signed a completely different version of the documents? You can have a problem. You can mess around with signed documents and you can mess around with editable documents, but you can't mess around with partially signed documents because you're waiting on other signatures and it's not fair to start changing the terms mid negotiation with partial signatures. So if I have a problem with this purchase contract and there was an error on that price of 300,000, and I want to make it 350, the first thing I have to do is lock down the signature request. Because right now, there's still an outstanding signature request for the wife or the buyer to sign because it's partially signed and there's outstanding signatures that are waiting. So how do I lock down the document and terminate the signature requests? Operations and mark as signed. Mark as sign locks down all the signature boxes. Now all the signature requests are deactivated. Mark as sign. Marking as signed will cancel any outstanding signature request containing this document. Are you sure you want to lock down this document? Yes, I do. Now I have the document here locked down. Now I can play around with it, okay? If I open up the document, I will see that there is a problem on the document with the sale price of $300,000. It was supposed to be 350, okay? So there's two ways, two different options of how I can fix this, even though I only have one signature and I'm still waiting on other signatures. Two choices to select from, okay? The first choice on my problematic purchase contract that is now locked down is if I go to operations, the first choice is I want to make a copy of the document. Always copy the document. I click copy. When I copy it, it asks me, do you want to amend this document, create a copy of the completed document to mark up and amend, which means it's going to leave the signatures in place that are already there? Or alternatively, do I want to make a clean copy of the document create a copy of the original document before it was ever sent for signatures. What is it you want to do? Do you want to leave the existing signatures and start striking things out, chopping it up and reinitialing the changes? Or do you want to start with a brand new virgin document like it was never sent? Let's try both and decide what we prefer, what we're happy with. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to click copy and then copy. So again, we're going to go to the purchase contract that has a problem. We're going to go to operations. We're going to click copy the document over, and we're going to make a clean, fresh, brand new copy of the document and push OK. When I do that, the software is going to create a fresh, new, unsigned version of the document. Here is the version of the document that has a problem on it. And here is the brand new photocopy of that same document with the same name that is back in edit status. Now, I don't want to confuse myself by having two versions of the document. So if I want to file this away, I can archive it and file it away. Okay, but I'm not ready to do that just yet because this is a training exercise. Different in practice versus training. In a minute, I will file it away, but not just yet. Let's look at the clean copy of the document. On the clean copy of the document that was just created for me, every single field has been reactivated as editable. And notice my customer's signature has been stripped off the document. It is a brand new virgin document prior to ever being sent out. 
the mistaken sale price, if I preview with my eyeball, the price of $300,000, I can fix nice and clean, put my mouse in here and change the price from 300 to $350,000, save my work. And now I have a nice, clean, unmarked up, undamaged document that says $350,000. And I can send this out for signature to everybody all over again from scratch. Nice and clean. Now, this is not what Ken Mills asked me a moment ago, because Ken Mills doesn't want to start with a brand new seller's disclosure. That was you that asked the question, right, Ken? Yes? Correct. Perfect. This is not what Ken Mills wants to do. This is a good example if you want to clean up the document before it ever goes out for signature, because maybe you don't want to embarrass yourself with a listing agent before you present an offer with all different kinds of crossouts all over this messy, sloppy document. This is a brand new, fresh document. Everybody has to sign it all over again. Is that hopefully that's clear to everybody? If anyone is unsure of what I just explained, let me know because that is our clean, fresh, virgin, unsigned document. What Ken Mills wants to do is Ken Mills wants to take a document that already is partially completed and signed, and Ken Mills wants to strike it out and make changes. So he's going to go to the exact same purchase contract that's here, and he's going to go back to the signed document, click the operations button, scroll down to the word copy. And instead of clicking copy, copy to create an original, he's gonna do copy amend, make it amendable. Create a copy of the completed document, which is what he has, a completed seller's disclosure that has mistakes, so he can mark it up and amend it. Copy amend, and he's gonna push okay. The software is now gonna create an amendable version of the document. Whoa, I am super confused now. I've got a signed version, I've got a copy, I've got a second copy. This is getting real messy. So I'll tell you what we're gonna do. We're gonna take the sign version that we don't wanna keep in our face and we're gonna file this away by clicking operations, archive. This is gonna move that sign version down to the bottom into my archive folder. The next thing we're gonna do between these two copies of the document is to take the one that I made three minutes ago, which was the copy copy, different than the one I made one minute ago, which was copy amend. And I'm gonna store this puppy away too, cause I don't wanna see this one. Operations, archive. I am not deleting it. You can't delete it. It's needed for compliance. There is no delete option. There is no trash can. There is no recycle bin. There is archive. If I go down to the archive folder over here, I will see those documents are still readily available and I can pull them out any time that I want. I've just moved them out of my face so as not to get confused. I pushed them down to the bottom of the list. Let's go into Ken Mills's editable document now. I go right in here. The document is still initialed by my customer on the bottom of the page. I see his initials are still right here. It's still all filled in, which we talked about earlier. I've got that $300,000 price. Um, where the heck is the price? 300,000, is that down below? Here's my $300,000 price. Let me make the screen bigger so you guys can see it. Here's my $300,000 price right there. And I am gonna scratch this out because that's what Ken says was a mistake on his seller's disclosure. I'm gonna click right next to it and I'm gonna add a strikeout box and I'm gonna strike out that price. I can put that strikeout box wherever I want it. I'm gonna strike out that price because that price is wrong. Make that strikeout line as long as I want. Now there's two ways to add features to the page. You remember I told you, you can right click and add features. You also have the choice of clicking add. I want to add in a new text box. Either way is fine. The add button or the right click button. Here is what I just dropped on the page. I'm gonna take my mouse and put the new price right over here. And I'm gonna type the new price in this box for Ken Miller of $350,000. Does it have to be that big? No. Can I make the font bigger if I want the font to be bigger? I can change the font. I can make the font bigger if I want it bigger. I've got a lot of flexibility to make whatever changes I think are proper over here to make it match. So now if I push the eyeball for Ken Miller, I can see that I've amended the document 
to strike out the mistake of three hundred thousand dollars and overlay a new text box of 350. And it's probably a good idea to have my customer initial off that mistake as well. Right click, add in a space for my seller to initial the change. The seller is a woman. The, sell, the woman has a husband. So she's gonna have to initial that change as well. I'm gonna put those initials right here. I'm gonna assign this to the first seller, which is the woman. I'm gonna assign this to the second seller, which is the man. And now I can resend that marked up document for Ken Miller back to the customer, which has the proper price and a place for the customer to initial the changes that I had to clean up. So you decide what it is you want to do? Do you want to copy the document back to its virgin state with no messy crossouts and no messy initials and no messy overlay text boxes by pushing copy and then copy? Or do you just want to make a little change like this and push copy amend so you don't have to go back and clean up everything? Those are your choices. Does that make sense, Ken? Yeah. All right. One question. In the case I was talking about a seller's disclosure, they're checking boxes where they're answering yes or no to questions. Let's just say the seller checked yes on a question. And when I explained it to him over the phone, he goes, oh, I should have checked no. How should he go back and then change that? Do I have to resend that document to him? I would, I would, I would lock down the document by pushing signature signed. You have to lock it down, it's signed. Then I push copy amend and I would strike out that one mistake out of the 74 questions and send yeah. back to him that document with that one initial change. Okay, so he's got to strike it out. He can't go back no, no, in. He, he can't strike it out. He can't make any changes. The only thing he can do is print it out on paper and sign it the old fashioned way, which is real foolish, or he can sign it electronically. He has okay. no ability to make changes once he's locked in his answers. So, I, uh, so if I wanted him to change it himself from a yes to a no, the checkbox, he would. I would have to resend him the document. Uh, could I resend it to him as a clean copy? You can, and, and, but I think he's not going to be happy with you because there's 74 questions. Exactly. And if you send him a clean copy, he's going to have to answer all 74 questions. If you That's, do copy amend, you can strike out just question 19 that is wrong, and you can have him re-answer just question 19. But then he'd have to initial that strikeout. Which I just show you how to do it. You're going to add okay. a strikeout bar, a text okay. box. That was my question. Out. There's no way for him to go back and edit that document and just change that one question. No, sir. See, that, to me, that's a big problem because it's with, I hate to use the term dot loop or transaction desk. We can do that. They can go back in. I can look at it and see what they filled out. And if I think they misunderstood a question, I can explain it to them. And then they can go right back in and correct it before I let them sign. I will ask the engineers who design it, the, the programmers, I will ask them if there's a way that prior to the customer signing and confirming their answers, if there's a way that you can review it, which is what you're asking me. Yes. And I, and I will get back to James with an answer on that. Okay. I think that would be, a, I know it would be a big help to me. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure most agents that I know would want the same thing. We want them to be at the seller to be able to fill it out because it's their responsibility to fill it out. But we all know a lot of times they screw it up. And so if I can look at it and see what they've done and explain to them why I think they might have answered that question wrong, they can go ahead then and correct it before we sign it. I understand. I understand. That, that would be a big help. I, I know it would be to me and I don't think I'm the only one that would want that. I understand. The HOA document too. Yes, community. The two disclosures that we have them fill out: the seller's disclosure and the community association. And they definitely screw up that community association a lot of times. So, to me, that would be a tremendous well, effort. I, 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 I made note of that. I will get with Ben and Matt and the engineers, and we will address this and see if we can't make this happen for everybody. Got it. I'm the only one. I, you know, I apologize if I'm the only one, but I don't yeah, think I'm I check it for you. That's how that's how we get better. That's how we improve. That's how we further adapt. So uh, thank you for bringing it up. And, and maybe it's a question other customers have asked that we can do. I will find out for you and I'll get back through James. OK, thanks. OK, my pleasure. Any other questions on the two options of copy, copy or copy amend on these documents? 
so that you can decide how you want to organize yourself. Okay, so I think we've done a good job of going through these documents and understanding how they can be used. Uh, I can't stress enough how helpful that operations archive business is because when you have six, seven, eight, nine, ten copies of the exact same document, it becomes really confusing, my friends. So I urge you to take the extra copies and suppress them down to the bottom of the file by archiving them for storage purposes. Okay. Um, so there you go. That's uh, that's good to go. Okay. So we've got all these different tabs. One of our friends on the call asked about the people tab. The people tab talks about all the different people that are involved in the transaction. Now, the agent that created the file is here. Mark Spain does not work for your company. He works in another company. That's the cooperating agent who has the listing. There was a question earlier today's call about additional agents. Additional agents are other Southern Classic agents from your company that you want to add into this deal. Now, this is not necessarily for commission purposes. You may or may not be sharing commission with this person. The purpose of additional agents is to invite another agent from your office to have complete and full access to the file. If the person does not deserve to have complete access and you don't want them in the file, do not invite them. If I don't want an agent by the name of Ken Mills in my file, I am not going to add Ken Mills in my file. Because when I add him in, next time he logs into our brokerage, he has complete access to this transaction. If I don't want Ken in the file, I'm going to remove him from the file so he does not have access to the transaction. Okay? That's what additional agents is for. It has nothing to do with commission per se. Vendors. Vendors are the people that are helping you in the transaction. Mortgage, title, landscape, construction appraisal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People that you may short, share documents with, people you may be communicating with, people that might be profiting off your transaction. Why is that helpful? Let me explain some of you. I don't know who Leslie Lemke is. I have no clue whatsoever. But the software tracks how often you use vendors. If you have an open house and you want to have someone sponsor it, and bring the cookies and bring the brownies and bring the flowers to make the house look pretty, it may not be a bad idea to run a report under the reports tool in Total Brokerage right over here to see how many times you've used Leslie Lemke in your transaction. Hey, Leslie, this is a Larry Johnson calling. How you doing? And she says, I'm doing fine, Larry. What can I do for you? Hey, Leslie, look here. Uh, I'm having an open house this weekend and uh, I'm going to have about 50 people and I need about 50 brownies and 50 cookies and 15 balloons. And I need about three dozen roses to make the house look pretty. I would really appreciate if you would sponsor my open house. And she says, hey, Larry, I'd love to help you out, my friend, but I can't do that because you see, if I open up that can of worms for you, I'm gonna have to sponsor Ryan and Susan and Chitara and Sheeran and Kathy and Joey and Lakeisha and Tim and Gilda. I gotta sponsor everyone's open houses. Leslie, I ran a report in Total Brokerage. Do you know that I used you 11 times to close my transactions as the attorney? Well, yeah, Larry, I appreciate that. Leslie, I am a business owner. I'm an independent contractor. I'm a realtor. It costs me money to have open houses. If you want me to have open houses and you want me to sell more houses and you want me to continue using your law firm, I'm going to suggest that you go down to the local Publix or the local IGA or the local Gristini's and pick up about $100 worth of balloons and brownies and cookies. And I'll see you about 1030 in the morning on Sunday for the open house. Otherwise, do not expect further orders on title from me. Wow, Larry, that's a valid point. I guess in business, there's more to business than simply providing good service. If I look back at my records, I've made $39,000 this year off of you, Larry. I guess it's not too much to ask to bring some darn brownies to your open house. Or of course, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to. You can keep maxing out your Visa and your MasterCard on buying cookies and brownies, and you could do that yourself. But it's always my thought that if you're referring business to people, while it's illegal to get kickbacks and we never want you to break the law, there is nothing illegal about asking your vendors to sponsor your postcards, sponsor your mailers, sponsor your brokers open, sponsor your open house, sponsor your yard sign. That is completely fair within the real estate industry. So think about ways that you might be able to 
offset some of your overhead by keeping track of how many vendors you are using because the software gives you the ability to track that and run reports accordingly. The contacts down below give you the contact information for all the buyers and all the sellers in the transaction. Isn't it nice when you're using total brokerage on your four inch iPhone that you have one page called the people tab that shows you all of the people involved in your transaction as well as all of their contact information. My goodness, that's gonna make life easy when you're driving around town and you don't need post-it notes and scotch tape on your dashboard keeping track of everything because you have everything organized in one convenient, easy to navigate location. If you plan on sharing documents or requesting e-signature of people, you want to add them to the vendors portion because here is where you can share documents or send docs for e-signature. If it's a customer, buyer, seller, landlord, tenant, you can share documents or send things for e-signature right over here. If you choose to add the person into your transaction and I want to link Larry Johnson into my transaction, I can do that with no difficulty this is for commission sharing purposes. If I add him here, it's going to allow me to spit out part of my commission that's coming to me and share it with my partner, Larry. This is to give access to Larry and to share money with Larry. That's what the purpose is this, okay? Any questions about the people tab, my friends? Moving on to the property tab. The property tab allows you to import from local MLS a lot of valuable information concerning your transaction, property address, legal description, tax ID, photos, and all the public remarks found in the RETS feed, which stands for Real Estate Transaction Standard. And most of the MLSs in Georgia are feeding into total brokerage. You may find a pocket MLS here or there that may not be feeding in, but James has done a really good job at connecting most, if not all, the MLSs to your account. So you just drop the MLS number of the property in here that you want to import and it will allow you to do that. This is very helpful when you're drafting purchase contracts or leases on behalf of buyers and tenants because all that valuable rich data found on the MLS can easily be imported right from the MLS into your total brokerage file. Step one is put the MLS number in this box. Step number two is push fetch. Fetch imports the data from the MLS and step three is push save. Step one, MLS number. Step two, fetch. Step three, save. Once you've done that, if you want to further your relationship with the MLS by downloading photos or any other details on the property, go to the actions tab and click create PDF from MLS. If you create the PDF from the MLS, which is optional, you don't have to do that. That's just further cements your relationship with the MLS. The software is going to deposit in your documents tab a new uh, document. That new document is called the MLS from the PDF. And here it is, the MLS report. If I click on the MLS report, I will see that it is downloaded and siphoned out for me all the details found on the MLS concerning this property. Now, why did we do that for you? We created an addendum to contract with data found in the Georgia MLS for this property with this MLS number, because we thought it might be helpful for you to have a screenshot of what makes up this property. What happens if the customer is advertising an MLS, the property is made with gas heating? And what if you find out during the inspection or the day before closing is actually electric? If you're relying solely on the MLS, we know there's a disclosure on the MLS that says, we believe all information on the MLS is accurate, but we have no responsibility for the mistakes found in the MLS. So if this property actually has electric heat and not gas, you don't have any recourse for that mistake on the MLS because you already have a disclosure that says we're not responsible for any mistakes. What happens if you go beyond the MLS and you put into the purchase contract that is fully executed by all buyers and all sellers, this house has gas heating. Now your buyer has a claim against the seller for misrepresentation. Now you have a bargaining chip to negotiate if you need to negotiate some type of a credit or even an opportunity for your buyer to back out of the contract for wrong information because it was certified and signed off in the purchase contract. So we download for you all the details of the MLS and make those details 
optionally e-signable, e-initialable by the buyer and the seller for your convenience to, co to correct mistakes that may exist in the MLS. Not only are we producing all of the MLS public remarks, we're also giving you all the photos. That could be helpful. How many times have you shown a house that had stainless steel silver appliances, and then when you go do your walk through the day before closing, the appliances are either missing or the color has magically changed? Why are these appliances white? When I showed the property, they were stainless steel. That's why we download all the photos, because we want you to have a record of whatever was in the property. When I showed this property, bedroom number two had beautiful floors. Day before closing, I do my walkthrough. The floors are all scratched up and damaged. Why? Because the seller slid the heavy furniture out and damaged the floors, even though the floors were not damaged when I showed the property. They owe you a repair credit or some resolution to fix the damaged floors. That's why we siphon out all the photos for you and make a record of it in your total brokerage file. And you have the ability, if you want, to have all these pictures signed off as well. They also can be amendable. All these photos can be amended if you wish. If there is uh, something uh, changed in the property, so for example, here, this carport is no longer part of the property, you can actually put a strikeout tool right over here and put a strike through. And you can cross out the carport with a single line such as this, or you can add in a strikeout tool such as strike through box, and you can block out the entire carport with a big X just like this. And then just for discussion purposes, we can overlay a text box to make sure everyone is clear. The carport below is excluded from the sale of the home and will be removed. Do you think that might be a good idea to have everybody initial off in that picture so we're clear about what stays and what goes? Because I know if that's not covered, when I get to closing, someone's gonna be having a fist fight that the carpet is missing and I wasn't expecting that. Sorry about that, somebody just rang my doorbell. Sorry, my dogs are barking, I apologize. Any questions about this optional tool available to you with the photos and the MLS? Okay, the financial tab. The financial tab powers all of your reports. The financial reports ben, power, ben, yes, sir. Ben, may I interject one thing real quick? Yes, sir. On the uh, property tab where it has the MLS number, currently that is showing Georgia MLS. We have just implemented FMLS, Georgia MLS, the Tipton MLS, um, and the rest of the MLS is Central Georgia, Lake Country, Valdosta, they're all working on that. So in just another few days, the agent can put their respective MLS numbers regardless of which MLS they're working in throughout the state. So I've been very diligently trying to get that done this week. Awesome. That sounds great. Very, very good. Great, great progress. I mean, you've worked so hard on this, James. It's unbelievable. It's great. Uh, the financial tab. This is going to be your best friend or your worst nightmare. It's your best friend if you fill it out. Because if you fill it out, it's going to fill your purchase contract. If you fill it out, it's going to fill your disbursement authorization, which goes to your bookkeeper. If you fill it out, it's going to allow you to run reports on your sales. If you fill it out, it's going to allow you to fuel your desktop widgets, which are all the statistical metrics. If you fill it out, James is going to be very happy. If you don't fill it out, you won't get paid your commission. Why? Because the DAs and the checks come from here. You must fill this out. SCR needs this information in order to pay you. You need this information to fill out your purchase contracts and listing agreements. So please, 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 please don't skip the financial tab. The fields are all quite obvious what they represent. Please fill them in. Down below, there's an optional section, which is called transaction expenses. If you enjoy paying income taxes and you get your jollies off of April 15th, owing as much money as possible, then please ignore this entire section. If one of your goals is to find worthwhile and legal tax deductions, so you have to pay smaller income taxes, please take this section very seriously. This section allows you to keep track 
of every single dollar you spend on this transaction. This section allows you to keep track of all of your deductions. This section allows you to upload receipts for anything that you spend so that you have an organized method of tracking your P&L, your income versus expenses. So I'm gonna track all of my expenses on this transaction and I'm gonna upload my receipts. Why am I gonna do that? Because even though I made $10,000 selling this property, I had $1,150 worth of documented expenses and I've been able to deduct my legitimate expenses from this so I pay less taxes because I don't wanna pay taxes on $1,150 worth of legitimate deductions that I have. That's between you and your bookkeeper, of course. Where are you gonna put the receipts to back up and support these things? Not difficult, my friends. After you save your work, you're gonna make sure you upload the receipts into the file by either A, emailing your receipts directly into the transaction, which I've talked about several times already, or alternatively, actions, uploading them as PDFs right from the desktop of your computer. Either way, you wanna bring those receipts in here so you can manage all of your deductions in accordance with your income. Any questions on the financial tab that is so important? Okay. Base commission, something else that is super important. Your mathematical calculations of how you get paid are all processed through here. All you have to do is enter in the commission income. I brought in $9,750 on this transaction. There was a referral fee automatically deducted to Op City because the lead came from them. I had a transaction fee payable to my broker. And my transaction, I don't know what your transaction fees are. So Ben, time out right there, please, sir. At the top, the gross commission income is ninety-seven fifty. dollars If we're paying a referral out to Op City, that is correct. But when you get down below the blue line, that's where the agents will put the transaction fees and FMLS fees because of tax purposes. We're, we, we 1099 based upon gross income less referral. If there's no referral, then we 1099 based upon gross commission income. Then underneath the blue line for each agent respectively, they will have their own deductions and they can deduct their own deductions on their income taxes themselves. So that's why I pulled that down. If you go down and look below the blue line, Ben, scroll down a little bit for me, buddy. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Just keep going a little bit more. Right there, you'll see now where I put the deductions in for FMLS and for the transaction fee for this example. Hope that helps. Thank you. So here, 9750 is the total commission that came in on this deal. Op City takes their cut if it's an Op City deal. Now here, James is not the broker. Here, James is one of the agents. In this dummy transaction, James is an agent. Is it fair that James is getting all the money as one of the agents and he's leaving Larry with nothing? Of course, that's not fair. Larry offered to help James and Larry said he would take 30% because he was gonna be out of town most of the time and he wasn't that experienced. So James is getting 70 and Larry gets 30. How do we split this up? Right over here, edit transaction splits. James is getting 70% of this deal and Larry is getting 30%. Obviously these two numbers clearly have to equal 100. Now all the math has changed. James is getting 70% of the 7,800, which is here. Larry gets 30% of 7,800. James, the agent, not James, the broker. James, the agent, not James, the broker, cannot click on Larry's name. That's why he turns red. Larry cannot click on James's name because when Larry's in his profile, if he clicks here, it'll be red. Why? Because this blue bar is the blue bar of confidentiality. Everything below the blue bar of confidentiality is, ta-da, confidential. Each agent has different financial obligations. Each agent has different splits. Each agent has a different arrangement, whatever that may be. The blue bar of confidentiality keeps private your personal affairs. So James and Larry, two agents in the company, can mutually see this top line information because this is shared. But the bottom blue line of confidentiality is all private information. 
Any questions? No? Make sure that you would be, that would be the same thing. And, and real quick, Ben, that would be the same thing if two agents are cutting a deal together, they would split the FMLS fee in half. And if they're doing a transaction fee, they would split that in half. So um, if you need questions about that, Sandy will be available, so will I. Um, but this page is super important for reporting purposes for 1099 and reporting purposes for your business monthly, quarterly, yearly. And so the financial tab and the base commission tab both are crucial. If if in a we're gonna what we're gonna do in the next two weeks, we're gonna have just a little short period of time of learning curve. If an agent does not fill out that financial base commission and in just a second, the, the calendar tab, DAs will not be signed. They will not be signed until this stuff is properly done. And we have to make sure that we're doing our processes for compliance and transactions to, it, to make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to be doing on our end to run an efficient real estate company. So and this, this few is more Sandy. days. This is Sandy. It is not that we're trying to be difficult. It's not that we're trying to be the wicked witch of the West to get this stuff done. It is that when we do 3,000 transactions, if I have to go in and change all these commission tabs and the financial tab and the calendar tab, and I have to do this, it means DAs are very slow to get signed. So it's, it's not that we're trying to be difficult. It's that you guys know the transaction, you guys know the numbers. Once you get in the habit of doing it, it's gonna be fast to do these pages, I promise. You know, help us help you. That's, you know, Jerry Maguire, help help me help you. And that's what we're here for. We want to, we're not only giving you the best financial means in the business with our model, we also want to be efficient and effective for you so that you can get paid at the closing and not have to worry about sending us a check and have to cut you back a check. So help us help you. And uh, Sandy is de very dedicated on what will be right with this is concerned, and so am I. So thank you in advance for helping us with these, these tabs. Go ahead, Ben. Okay. So I think we need to uh, kind of jump ahead because of our time constraints today to the checklist for compliance because I think that's super important. Um, each one of these fields is rather yep. obvious. You're not going to use bonus commission very much, if at all. Earnest money, you're going to load in who's holding the deposit so you don't forget who's holding the escrow deposit. Calendar allows you to track all the critical dates in the transaction. These calendar date entries feed your purchase contract. They feed your listing agreement. They feed your lease. They also feed the calendar back on the front page of Total Brokerage. The calendar on Total Brokerage also feeds your iPhone or Android calendar. So these dates feed a lot of different things. Uh, you lose a lot of value if you don't fill these in. Email. We shared with you. You can email documents please, in. Ben, real yes, quickly, sir. please use the closing date. Regardless of anything else on that calendar, make sure you got that closing date in there. That's crucial for reporting purposes for us to be able to find transactions and things that have closed. Move forward with the email. Sorry. No, the closing date is important, but quite frankly, my friends, as long as you're typing it either on the contract or in this box, either place, you're covered. The only time you're not covered, my friends, is if you're printing out blank contracts on paper and you're hand filling in. I don't know why in the year 2021, you would possibly print out blank contracts and hand fill them in. As long as you type it on the contract or type it here, you're good to go. Very important for reporting, you have a closing date filled in. Email tab, we explained to you that many times over today, that under the general tab, there's that constructive email address where you can email documents in. I'll repeat what I said earlier. If you personally email something into your file, it'll go directly into the documents tab, no problem. If anybody else other than you emails it in, then it's going to go into the email folder for review so you can review it before downloading it and porting it into your file. James Hamby has some obscure AOL address, James loves the Bulldogs at AOL.com, right? That is not his total brokerage email address. He just happens to have James loves the Bulldogs at AOL. If James Hamby sends an email from James Loves the Bulldogs at AOL.com into Total Brokerage, it's going to treat that email as a stranger because it doesn't recognize that email address. 
no different than the appraiser, the home inspector, the title company, the mortgage company. And it's going to deposit that email into the email folder until it is verified by you for authenticity. The only email that's gonna go in here directly and bypass the email tab and deposit the documents in the documents tab is the one single email James has, jameshamby at gmail.com. Nothing else is gonna work for automatic import of documents. Okay, um, activity tab. Activity tab allows you to communicate with your colleagues. As you know, in this simulated example, Larry Johnson is my partner on this file. I'm gonna make a note. The appraisal is expected to be done on Friday. Larry, mark your calendar and follow up. So I can actually flag a note to Larry in the file because under the notifications field where I typed in the name, an alert went to my broker and to my partner. If I want a reminder on Friday to follow up with the appraiser, I'm gonna add this note to my calendar because when I add it here to calendar on Friday, not only am I gonna remember on Friday about this issue, it's gonna go into my total brokerage calendar, which feeds to my iPhone, Android, Microsoft, Outlook, and Yahoo calendars. Now, do you wanna drive poor James, your broker, Looney Tunes with every single file update? My goodness gracious, there's not enough time in the day. There's hundreds of you and one of him. So you can always remove James from notifications. You do not need to link him in to every single time you go to the restroom. He does not need to know every time you go to the restroom. That's your business. Just share it with your partner, Larry, on this deal. However, if you have to notify Sandy about something, check this out. Hey, Sandy, it's my first time using TB, and I want to be sure I did the DA correct. Can you please check it for me? I can link in Sandy to this deal. Now Sandy is going to get a notification. Well, whoops, I mean, I link in James and Larry. Sorry about that. I can take this information, and I can link it directly in there. So now when I save this note, the note goes in my file and Sandy just got an email asking her to check my DA. So you can link in other people from your company with notes here if you wish them to be involved in your transaction for whatever reason. Ken Mills cannot link Caitlin Rollins into this deal because Caitlin Rollins has nothing to do with this transaction at all. He can only link in his partner, Larry Johnson, or one of his managers, bookkeepers, or compliance officers. If he wants to link Caitlin in, then he has to add her in the people tab as an additional agent. That's a security measure because we don't want him accidentally clicking on Caitlin's name and sharing all of his private business with Caitlin that has nothing to do with her. That's why her name doesn't pop up in the dropdown list. The only names available are your management team and any SCR agents that you have intentionally linked into this transaction by design. Any questions about the activity tab? Nope, it's just a great means for the staff to communicate with the agent, the agent to communicate with the staff on this particular transaction. Good to go. Right, and by the way, Sandy, if you're listening, if you wanna write back, Hey, Ben, your DA looks great. You'll see it'll pop up right in my activity tab that Sandy went back and checked my DA for me. She can write back in and reply to me accordingly. The next tab after activity is the checklist. Under the checklist, this is where we handle compliance. Compliance, compliance, compliance. Our friends at the State Association of the Government in Georgia are highly regulatory. We want to make sure that we keep our hands clean and we stay on the good side of the law. This is our transaction turtle. His name is Tommy. For short, we call him Tommy. It's real easy. Tommy, the transaction turtle, moves across the screen. His goal is to get to closing over here. Every time you satisfy a compliance obligation, Tommy inches his way to closing. If you don't have a lockbox, then don't click, I have a lockbox. Click, not applicable. If you don't have a yard sign, don't click, I have a yard sign. Click, not applicable. Tommy moves farther and farther and farther. So each item you're completing, you check off. So far, you have not invited the compliance officer, John, into the file. Does that mean that John can't get in? Absolutely not, that's not what it means. John can come in here anytime he wants. That's his job, he's a supervisor. However, you haven't invited him in. You haven't invited James in. 
You have an invited Sandy in. They can come in anytime they want because they're in management, but there's an invitation process if you specifically want to invite them in. Down here, if you check the box, it says, sorry, you must select at least one document to mark this as complete. You know that because it says, which documents do you want us to review? Exclusive sellers brokerage engagement F101, authorization to show. So I'm gonna find that document. When I click my mouse in here, it links automatically to my documents folder. When I'm in the checklist and I pick one of these document boxes, all it's doing is giving me a highlight view of what is available to me in my documents folder. So I'm going to pick whatever document is related to these instructions and I'm going to mark it as complete. This is not applicable. So I'm gonna skip it because it's not applicable. This, I'm gonna mark off the documents that I need to show as complete. Whoops, sorry about that. It's complete. This down here, I'm gonna mark off with the requisite documents to show that it is complete. This is not applicable, so I'm gonna skip it. Very, very simple process. We're telling you everything we expect from you and everything we need from you. So you fill them out. Suddenly, after you go all the way down to this area, as far as you can go and you check it off, now a button appears, request review. This is the first time you have been forced to stop. Now, when you uncheck this, there is no button. There's no more check marks to move forward. You cannot proceed. But once you check off or disregard all these boxes up here and you get this far down, now this box appears. Request listing compliance to SCR. There's your invitation. When I invite John into the file, I am telling him that my turtle has gone as far as he can go and all these black and white boxes can be checked and unchecked and my turtle can move forwards and backwards once I request a review, I can no longer play with these check marks. So I'm going to ask John to come check my file. Watch what happens to these black check marks when I click the blue request review button. Click. Boom. Now they are locked down. I can no longer play with the file because I've told John I've gone as far as I can go and I'm not messing with it anymore. John just got an invitation from me and it says, Dear John, Ben Schachter wants you to review the 1170 Baxter Court Stratham file. And John is gonna review it. John has a choice when he reviews it. He can accept my progress and approve me or he can fail me. If he fails me, he will tell me why he failed me and he'll be able to communicate with a report in total brokerage as to where I am deficient or delinquent. I missed some signatures, I forgot a disclosure, I typed something incorrectly, whatever my delinquency is. If there's a delinquency, he'll let me know what it is. But once he approves me, whatever that is, I'm gonna have another series of check marks that pop up. I can't go any farther right now. And my poor buddy, Tommy, is totally frozen and stuck in the mud until my compliance officer, John, approves me. Once John approves me, this will light up and I'll have another series of check marks that takes me through the next stage of the transaction. You can't go forward until John approves you. You can't go backwards once you've asked John to come into the file. You can only wait for John to get back to you. Now notice every time I checked one of the boxes, or skip something, the software time and date stamped the time of day and the date of the year that it was when I checked it off. Why is that? So that management can see how long this process takes me. And guess what? James has his eye on John because when John finally approves this file, it's gonna show how long it took for John to approve it. And I can be sure you, I can assure you that John's gonna approve this in short order, relatively quickly. You're not gonna get a response from John six days from now. James will lose his mind if it takes John six days to review your file. So when he reviews it, there'll be a time and date stamp that tracks everything and you'll have another series of check marks to move on, okay? But you must follow the process of either checking off the boxes, indicating what documents you want Sandy to review, I'm sorry, John to review, or skipping something by indicating it is not applicable. Any questions about this process as we wait on John to approve my file or decline my file because of deficiencies? Any questions at all? John is getting tested for COVID today because I obviously have COVID, so he cannot pass or fail you at the moment, Ben. 
But no, if you no do get past, it goes in the process. And if you just follow each step, I will say at the top, you have a checklist. I'm creating checklists for everything. Residential seller, residential buyer, commercial buyer, commercial, commercial seller, new construction. And as we continue to go about, you will see that I will have set different checklists up for each transaction based on the merit of that transaction, like new construction or commercial or residential or tenant or landlord. So um, I was up literally till over 2.30 this morning working on this stuff. I've got COVID. The only place I can be is in my office or my bedroom. So I promise you over the next few days as I'm quarantined, I continue to work on this literally from the time I get up to the time I go to bed. I have nothing else to do. Please check your activity tab. Thank you, Sandy. Let's check the activity tab. Looks great, have a great day. Thank you so much, Sandy. See, very efficient. All right, guys, I think we've covered about as much as we can cover today. Is there anything that we've left out for today, John? Excuse me, James, that you'd like me to cover? No, I think you went through everything. If anybody has any questions, again, I'm pretty much wide open. Call me or call Total Brokerage. Cover that real quick with us. Yep, that's what I got right over here. So, go ahead. number one, if you guys have any chance of survival with Total Brokerage, any chance of survival, I beg of you, create a dummy fake customer in the CRM and create a dummy fake transaction. Do not try this with a real heart beating customer or you're gonna get stressed out, nervous and anxious. Use your dog, use your spouse, use your child, use your neighbor and just go through the process as if it were real so you can get comfortable with it because you're only gonna learn it from doing it, not just from watching me. This video has been totally recorded as all the other ones have. James is creating a great video library for training purposes. You can watch this over and over again. But if you need help, we provide stellar customer service. And not only is it stellar, it is all US based and we all speak English. You're not gonna be transferred to somebody in Bangladesh to help you that doesn't speak English. We're gonna do it for you. Everybody who works on Total Brokerage, the designers, the customer service, the trainers, we all work in the state of Florida and we all live here full time and we're all employees. None of us are subcontractors. So if you need help, the first line of help is the question mark button, top right hand corner of every page, top right hand corner of every page. It says help. You click on the help button right there and we provide you with, how can I help you? You can search for create a new transaction and we give you all the articles, upload a document and we give you all the articles. You can search for anything you want and we have tons of articles. Some of you like doing your own research based on searching for the help you need and that's great. Others of you want to talk to a human being and that's fine too. You have two choices to talk to a human being. You are welcome to call us at 561-766-0409. You are welcome to call us at 561-766-0409 but we only answer the phone Monday through Friday, nine to five. We're not gonna be answering your phone at two o'clock in the morning, Monday to Friday, nine to five, five, six, one, seven, six, six, oh, four, oh, nine. Or you can search all day long on the help desk free of charge. And that's 24 seven. If you have a specific question that you'd like to email in, that too is easy. Just click on new support ticket new support ticket. And this sends an email right to our customer service department to address whatever issue you have, a suggestion, a problem, a point of clarification, needing assistance, whatever. We're here to help you. So step one is when you're in total brokerage, click the question mark button for any help that you need. Step two is search for an article pertaining to whatever it is you're trying to resolve, 24-7, 365. Step three, you can call us Monday to Friday, nine to five, five, six, one, seven, six, six, oh, four, nine. Step four, 24 hours a day, you can create a support ticket. And we usually respond to these, usually from seven in the morning till seven at night. And we'll gladly respond as soon as we possibly can. Customer service is very important to us. We know this is a lot. We know it is a monstrously large product that you're learning for the first time. It's gonna take you a few weeks to get comfortable. 
But if you don't use it, you're not going to learn it through osmosis. I promise you that. We love the relationship with SCR. We're totally committed to your brokerage. We'll bend over backwards to provide training and support to make you comfortable. And we appreciate all of your patience and time today while learning about total brokerage. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Any last minute questions, my friends? No? Quick question. <laughs> yes, Ken. All right. Uh, where you download uh, documents into a single PDF file, it looks like you can only take them from the general documents folder. If you set up a folder, let's say uh, contract documents or listing documents, you can't download them from there. At least that's what happened when I tried to do it. I had to go into the general documents and pick them out from there, from all the other documents in there. It would be nice to be able to take them from a specific folder and to download them into a PDF. Sometimes you may have to send the contract to another agent by PDF. So the way you do that- If I've got them all, if I've got them all in one particular folder- I'm gonna show I'm you, only... Kenneth, it's all done for you. Right here okay. in my folder, I'm gonna to go to my documents tab, okay? And I go to, uh, hold on one second, move my screen. I go to documents, I'm in the documents folder for this transaction, actions, share documents right here. This will allow me to transmit the documents to anybody that I want. They can be emailed out. If I want to download them, I can download them. That brings them into my laptop. That brings them to my computer. If I want to send right, them right. to the listing agent, I can share them right here and I can share all the documents I want with whoever I want. But if I share them, it's not putting them all into one PDF file, right? Um, let's see, hold on one second. I'll share them with the vendor. I'm pretty sure it doesn't, I tried it. I don't think it does. Let's see. You know, the problem is I can't, uh, I don't even know how you would know that because once you push send, you're not going to see what they see on their end. It's going to say, dear I, Leslie. I, I, I tried one to myself in a, as a test case and I'm pretty sure it came as individual documents. That's, that's possible. And sometimes you want it as one single PDF file. But when I did that, I, it, I could only pick them out from the general documents folder and it had all kinds of documents in there. So I had to go through and figure to identify the ones I wanted to send. But if I already had them consolidated into say a contract folder, the purchase and sale agreement, uh, financing contingency exhibit, whatever, it was easy for me to just pick them from there. But Got it. This, okay. this, this didn't get, allow me to do it. I had to take them out of the general document folder. Understood. Okay, I will talk to the engineers about that too. And that, because that happens sometimes, some agents won't, you send them a contract, they want it in one PDF file. Understood, got it. Okay. I appreciate it, everybody. I wanna thank you all for your help and your assistance. Any other questions? Ken, thanks for the great feedback. Larry, thank you for letting me throw your name around a hundred times. Caitlin, thank you for letting me throw your name around a hundred times. I appreciate it. Great volunteers. James, you got an awesome group here. I really appreciate their time and everyone's uh, uh, patience with me and I hope you uh, have enjoyed this and I hope you learned something today. I'm going to stop the recording now and I will send James the recording to share with all of you as soon as it's done processing through Zoom. Okay, everybody? Thank you, Ben. I appreciate you. You know, it's interesting. We started this meeting with one president of the United States and we finished this meeting with a different president of the United States. Isn't that fascinating how that happened? I never had that before. Usually I start and finish meetings and usually it's the same person's president. I never had a meeting start and end with two different presidents, but that's kind of cool. First Bye everybody. Woo, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Ben. Thank you everybody.